Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jan Barris, Vice President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm very pleased to moderate today's program. In doing so, I also represent our two partners, the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan and the Michigan China Innovation Centers. Today, we have a terrific panel that will focus on how Greater China, South Korea, and Japan have handled various aspects of COVID-19. We are really pleased to be joined by three terrific specialists in their respective areas. I'm not going to read you their bios because we've sent you those already and we assume, hope, that you have read them. But just briefly, in order of the way they will be speaking, uh, first will be Ilana Uretsky, an assistant professor at Brandeis University and a medical anthropologist with a specialty in China. Anthony Kuhn is a name and I'm sure a voice that you will all recognize and it will be familiar to NPR listeners as he's covered much of Asia for that wonderful institution for many years now. And then we have Sheila Smith, a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and an expert on Japan. We've asked each of them to answer four basic questions. And that is how each of their areas, Greater China, South Korea, and Japan, have one, responded to the COVID-19 crisis and what drove the decisions that were made. Second, what is the current situation and how are their countries balancing public health with economic concerns? Third, what will or may change moving forward in these countries' relations with China? And fourth, what lessons might the United States learn from all of this? With that in mind, I want to turn it over to Ilana, and we're looking forward to hearing from the three of you and then to moving to Q&A. Go ahead, Ilana. Thank you, Jan. And thank you, everyone, for being here, <laughs> wherever here is today. So I've been given the task of talking about the response to the coronavirus, what we now call COVID-19, from the perspective of Greater China, uh, which includes China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Uh, so I get to talk about the beginning of the epidemic, where this epidemic started uh, in China. And before I talk about the, the start of the epidemic, I want to talk about how China was prepared for it, because we hear a lot about China's initial response and how they started a response. Uh, we all know that China and greater China uh, had experience with a virus like this from 2003, from the SARS epidemic, which was a time when China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan were not prepared for something like this. But they learned, they learned great lessons, uh, especially China. After the SARS epidemic, China invested the equivalent of a billion dollars into its public health system to improve public health surveillance. Uh, they, improve, they, they increased the number of professionally trained public health professionals. They, uh, they invested in, tech, in, in technologically advanced equipment. Uh, they created a comprehensive public health surveillance system that would help them track epidemic outbreaks from the township level all the way up to Beijing. Another measure that should, that, that's necessary for preventing epidemic outbreaks uh, is a pathogen-based surveillance system. In other words, a, a surveillance system that would connect the hospitals where diseases are detected and the public health system that, ha that, helps, to, uh, that helps to control the outbreak or the, the, that helps to control the outbreak of epidemics. And this really requires a connection between the hospitals and the microbiologists and the public health system. And this, it, it, it's interesting, there was, there was an article in 2011 from, uh, in, the, in the journal Health Affairs that pointed out that this is where China was lacking in its public health preparedness. It was lacking in its sort of, in, in, in the part of the public health system that would help it detect and, and monitor the outbreak of disease. So that was in 2011. 
uh, despite despite the fact that they had that they had improved uh, sort of the, the the technical parts of their public health system. Come two years ago, and now we're finding out that there is detection that in one of the laboratories that that had been built, um, one of the, the the highest level laboratories, a BSL lab, BSL four laboratory that was built in Wuhan that there were actually issues of um, a lack of, of, of technical um, capacity in the laboratory and they needed help and they reached out to the US for help and didn't get the help that they needed. And it's now actually suspected that the current coronavirus may have, uh, may have somehow escaped from that laboratory because appropriate uh, measures of protection weren't taken. It was a laboratory where they were doing uh, research on, on coronavirus. So China was, they, they, they were much more prepared than they were for SARS, but perhaps not as prepared um, as, would, as they needed to be for, for the outbreak of such, a, of such, a, such an epidemic. Uh, so when the epidemic broke out, they had to figure out what to do. And response didn't happen immediately. They had to learn what they were dealing with. Um, and figure out if it indeed did pose a significant threat to China and a significant threat to the US. Um, they considered what was coming up on the calendar, the Lunar, Ye Lunar New Year, the biggest holiday of the, of, the, of the year where people would be migrating all over the country. And so they had to consider both the economic impact and the social impact. And after considering that, they quickly realized that not doing anything wasn't feasible. And so they quickly figured out that they had to institute testing, isolation, and contact tracing. But there wasn't a test at the time because it was an emerging, it was a, it was a novel virus. Um, and they had an epidemic that was raging in a city of 11 million people. And so what they decided to do was cordon off the entire city to limit damage outside of Wuhan, right? So the, the epidemic broke out in the city of Wuhan. Um, so they cordoned off a city of 11 million people and eventually cordoned off other cities within the same province and 50 million people ended up under lockdown. They think that that may have uh, delayed the spread around China outside of Wuhan by three to five days and reduced case importations to other countries by 80% until mid-February. And they got the epidemic under control in a month, really through social distancing and case management. So they, they implemented really rigorous draconian policies of social distancing um, to keep people in their homes, uh, to restrict intracity and intercity tra travel, which admittedly would destroy an economy, but they knew it would slow down transmission and flatten the curve of the epidemic outside of Wuhan. They also implemented uh, strict case management. When they had a test, they implemented rigorous testing, isolation, contact tracing of anyone who had come into contact with someone who was infected, uh, and improvement of their medical resources. They also, they implemented centralized quarantine and isolation. So for anyone who was mildly ill, they were, they were placed into a centralized quarantine unit, not sent home. Uh, so by January 23rd, they had closed down all of Wuhan. Uh, there was no public tran transport. There was com compulsory wearing of masks. They limited social gatherings. Uh, by February 2nd, the government instituted, instituted a policy of centralized quarantine and treatment of all confirmed and presumptive case, cases. And by February 17th, the government in, initiated a door-to-door -door and individual symptom screening of all residents with support of people from the community. So walking around to people's houses and checking their temperatures. That did, that did a lot, um, but they still haven't let down their guard. So there are, there, there are currently almost no new cases of domestic infection of COVID-19 in China, but the isolation wards are still open for the mildly ill, quarantine centers are still open, monitoring systems of new cases in the neighborhoods 
are still going on. And they're opening up, but with caution, with great caution. Um, universities are scheduled to start to open up on May 11th, but again, slowly, with a lot of, with, with a lot of caution. Um, they, one of the things that China did was they really stressed their public health capacity. They had 1,800 teams of epidemiologists sent to Wuhan with a minimum of five people on each team. That enabled them to trace tens of thousands of contacts a day. Uh, if I compare that to the US where we have 600 people from the CDC who've, de who've been deployed around the country to help with our response. So I'm gonna move on to Hong Kong and Taiwan, which share the SARS experience with China, uh, but were, were able to act swifter, swifter because they saw what was coming. Uh, and again, very, very quickly mobilized resources for a rigorous response, um, but also in, implemented policies of transparency that aided their communication. So both, uh, both countries stressed diagnosis, contact tracing, isolation, and mitigation of cases. Um, they closed their schools almost immediately. They shuttered businesses. They shut down their borders with China and nearly everyone around Hong Kong and Taiwan was wearing surgical masks when they heard about the outbreak of this epidemic. There was aggressive contact tracing and people who were suspected of being exposed were quarantined. Taiwan also. Uh, Taiwan has 850,000 citizens living in China. They expected a high rate of importation of cases but to date have only had 395 cases and six deaths. Also learned from SARS and also instituted a quick response that started with screening passengers and all flights coming from Wuhan as early as late December. They instituted a very early deployment of their central epidemic command center, uh, something that was set up after SARS so that, that they were able to mobilize very quickly with the start of this epidemic. They started screening body temperatures of all inbound and outbound patients. Um, they planned for the production and rationing of critical materials so they, they didn't have shortages. They were also very transparent in their communication with daily updates on the numbers of cases, origins, and, and contact traces. Uh, and they instituted a very clear uh, program of communication with the public that helped them build up trust of the government and the efforts to control the epidemic. So I'll leave it at there um, so we can hear about what's going on around the rest of Asia. Next, I have a few questions already raised from what you said, but let's turn to Anthony Kuhn. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's very nice to join you today. Just coming off the heels uh, of an election which uh, provided a stunning reversal of fortunes for President Moon Jae in. Uh, and a lot of people voted based on their uh, approval of President Moon's handling of the COVID 19 virus. So, uh, what, what informed their, uh, their handling of the virus? What drove their decisions? Well, um, it was uh, mostly their experience of the SARS virus in, in 2003, and also uh, their experience of the MERS, or Middle Eastern Respiratory System, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus in 2015. They were the biggest, they were the hardest hit out in, in Asia by that disease. Uh, and so around that time, they decided their response to epidemics like this was going to be focused on two things, uh, fast and widespread testing and contact tracing. And that's what they did. And they overhauled their whole system around these two things. Uh, they fast-tracked approval for test makers. Uh, they had their capacity very quickly at 15 to 20,000 tests per day. They lined up private labs to analyze the results. They reorganized the KCDC, which is the Korean equivalent of our CDC, around testing. And they had innovations such as drive-through testing centers and walk-through testing centers, which have been copied elsewhere. They also overhauled their infectious diseases law to um, 
allow them to use cell phone data and credit card histories and surveillance camera footage to track the routes of infection. Uh, case numbers came down very quickly from a high of more than 900 a day at the end of February to where we are this week, which is under 30 a day. Mortality has been around 2%, which is far below the world average of six something percent, I believe. And they did it without locking down the country. Even at the height of the epidemic in late February, uh, the epicenter of the epidemic in Daegu, the country's fourth largest city, was, um, you know, you could get in and out. Uh, people were not on the streets a lot, but uh, things hadn't been shut down. Uh, universities and schools and a lot of businesses have been shut, but you can go out and uh, Seoul, for example, you still see quite a lot of people in, in restaurants and bars, although not as much as before. Um, despite their relatively good state of preparedness, uh, they were briefly overwhelmed in, in, in late February. Uh, and at that time, uh, their, you know, the, the, the routes of infection were too complicated. They weren't able to test, uh, to trace really well. So they had to convert to mitigation and to beefing up hospitals to deal with the influx. Now they have rolled out a data platform that cuts the uh, process of tracing infections from an entire day for one person down to 10 minutes, virtually to real time. Um, as the uh, case situation has gotten better, they've uh, looked at ways to uh, get along living with the virus for the longer term, which means a sort of uh, less intense uh, form of social distancing. Uh, but they put this off because they're concerned about a second wave. So they've erred on the side of, of caution instead of the economy. Uh, and to cushion the blow economically, South Korea's cabinet this week approved disaster relief payments uh, of about $820 to all citizens except for the richest 30% of South Korea. And they intend to take applications from eligible citizens for that before the parliament has even approved money. Um, China has figured prominently uh, in this whole thing. Um, South Korea was the second country that was get hardest, and a lot of the early cases came from China, and this is why it became a uh, highly politicized issue. Uh, there were petitions on the presidential website with over a million signatures calling for uh, the country to be closed to Chinese tourists. The government argued that wasn't necessary, and so uh, only uh, travelers from Hubei province, where Wuhan is located, um, was limited. Uh, Relations with China should be pretty good for the remaining two years of the Moon administration. Uh, President Moon Jae-in has a vision of integration with neighboring North Korea, economic integration. And for example, that includes train lines that will run up and down the peninsula and then proceed on into China and into Europe. In other words, linking up with China's one belt, one road system. Now, um, conservatives in this country fear that President Moon is getting too chummy with China and North Korea, and that he's moving away with traditional security cooperation with the U.S. and Japan. Uh, Japan ties with Japan have gotten a lot more tense. There's been a historical dispute which uh, spread into a, into a trade war and um, then affected security cooperation. Um, my, my take on this, not having been here a terribly long time, uh, is that uh, Moon Jae-in is basically, is indeed uh, what you would call a nationalist, and he seeks a more independent foreign policy for his country. And he also wants to rethink the Cold War era arrangement, including um, uh, ties with the US and Japan that were left over, it was sort of left to him from the Cold War area, era and a time when South Korea was under authoritarian military rule. Uh, Moon is very much a product of the country's democratic movement, uh, democracy movement, and so this is affected by that. Um, on the other hand, right now, um, it's really hard for conservatives to argue uh, that Moon Jae-in and his administration are undercutting the alliance uh, with the military alliance with the US. And that is because uh, President Trump has sought to increase 
South Korea's contribution to the cost of stationing uh, U.S. troops on the peninsula. Uh, last year, he asked for a 50% increase in Seoul's contribution. He got about 8%. This year, he asked for a about 500% increase. Um, and people here can only surmise from that either that um, you know, he's trying to shake the country down for money, or it's an excuse to pull troops out because he knows that Seoul is not going to pay. Uh, so Moon comes off as looking like a fairly, uh, fairly solid supporter of the alliance uh, with the U.S. Um, finally, uh, what lessons can the U.S. learn from South Korea? Well, it's already learned a lot. Uh, world leaders uh, have been calling Moon Jae-in for, for assistance and advice. President Trump called last month and asked for uh, test kits, and he's already gotten about 600,000 of them in localities, including Los Angeles, have signed their own deals uh, with biopharmaceutical, uh, with um, biopharm companies, and already gotten a lot of test kits. Uh, you know, South Korea has invested in basic health care infrastructure, and that contributed to their readiness uh, in terms of beds per. Um, Per thousand people, South Korea has 12.3 to the U.S. is three. Uh, your rates of surviving a major disease in South Korea uh, are, are very good, and they've had national health insurance for about 40 years. And um, it's also interesting to note President Moon's style. He has basically left the limelight for his KCBC chief, a woman who has since become the hero, uh, and that has left him free to take these uh, phone calls from world leaders. Yesterday happened to be uh, the sixth anniversary of the sinking of the Seawall Ferry, with, in which 300 young lives were lost. He said that, South, that on his watch, South Korea is not going to make that uh, mistake again. They're not going to lose lives unnecessarily because it will lose the people's trust. And that's underpinning his response to this, uh, to this crisis. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Very much, Anthony. We appreciate that really interesting overview and sort of are um, brought up by the fact that you have a leader who is so thoughtful about so many things. Uh, let's turn to Sheila Smith to focus on Japan. It's all yours, Sheila. Thank you, Jan. I'm delighted to be with you all. Um, let me give you a quick sort of update on what the Japanese approach to COVID-19 has been um, and talk a little bit about the Japan-China relationship, which is partially or mostly affected um, by the coronavirus in terms of the economic setback for Japan. But let me start with where Japan is at the moment. Um, you know, when we were all in the early months of this, we were all watching, you know, China and then Italy and you, we, we, that, that graph that was on the Financial Times, right, where Japan was surprisingly at the low end of the spectrum uh, with a very small number of cases, that, that situation has changed. There's an accelerated number now of, of new ca confirmed cases of COVID-19 patients in Japan. Um, but the early response of the Japanese <laughs> government, excuse me, was affected by a couple of things. Um, in January, there was sort of four cases reported, all of which had direct contact with Wuhan, China, in the Hebei province. Um, um, they were uh, people who'd been there, people who'd come back from there. Uh, but then Japan had the arrival of the Diamond Princess, the cruise ship uh, who, that was then uh, ported, uh, sitting offshore on Yokohama. And that drew an awful lot of international and domestic attention to how the Japanese government was quarantining the three or 4,000 passengers on this international cruise ship. Um, a lot of people uh, eventually became very critical of the Abe cabinet's approach, but um, they allowed people to come off the ship who then went on to be tested positive for the disease. So, but that was an early kind of uh, interaction between the Abe government and, and, and the international community over how to manage it. The infectious health uh, experts in Japan largely suggested to the prime minister that what, what Japan needed was a cluster strategy. In other words, to, to test places where people had we known had been known to have been uh, exposed, and then to do very serious contact tracing. So beyond the Diamond Princess, there was a focus on Hokkaido. There was a small cluster uh, outbreak in Hokkaido. Hokkaido is a ski resort, uh, very popular with foreign visitors. Uh, so of course, uh, that became a, a focus of attention as well. They shut down of travel between uh, Hebei province uh, early on, 
Uh, so travel to China was was uh, limited. Um, but it wasn't until later in February when when the European country travel for the European countries was limited, and then eventually the United States and, and other countries were added to that list. Um, now, <laughs> the Abbey cabinet has taken a very different approach. So last uh, Monday, the national emergency was declared, and that was uh, the product of a new law that was passed by the Diet, Jap the Japanese parliament. Um, it was an upgrade on the influenza law that they had put in place after the H1N1 um, uh, outbreak. Uh, but it allowed the Japanese prime minister to declare a national emergency. It was not compelling in the sense that it wasn't, he could not uh, tell people they had to remain at home, but it was a strong urging of uh, individuals as well as businesses to to so to isolate uh, to 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 restrict their movements. You saw throughout all the way up until that announcement by the prime minister, the Japanese were actually quite out and about uh, in urban centers. They did not seem to be all that worried. Um, cherry blossom viewing went on in some parts of Japan, not all parts of Japan, but in some parts and concerts were held and people attended that kind of thing. So there was a real worry that the num as the numbers started to tick upwards um, in March that the, the Japanese people probably needed a, a much, much more har harsh uh, warning about the implications of their behavior. Now, initially, this national emergency law was uh, covered seven prefectures, Tokyo and uh, the three prefectures surrounding Tokyo, Osaka and its suburban prefecture, and then Fukuoka City down in Kyushu. Today, however, um, the national emergency is indeed a national emergency. The entire country is being covered by this new law. Japan's challenge going forward, uh, the current caseload, just for people who like numbers, uh, it's striking at the end of <laughs> excuse me, January, Japan had 17 cases. Uh, end of February, 944. End of March, 2000, and then today it's just around 8,000 cases. So rapid escalation, acceleration in number of confirmed cases. Uh, lots of the criticism by epidemiologists, which I am not, by the way, so just to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm passing on others' expertise here, um, is that Japan could have done much more widespread testing. Um, and it, it did very limited testing and had the capacity to do much more. So that's where one of the critiques of the Abe government of the health ministry in particular come from. Um, but today it's largely Tokyo um, where people are quite worried. The percentage of those cases uh, that are residents of Tokyo is roughly around 30, 32%. Um, now, um, the new national emergency law, Abe, uh, the cabinet has basically said that they aim to restrict uh, movement up to 80% of the population. Uh, if you've been following Apple, uh, they have been mapping people's movements. And for people who've been following movements of Japanese in Tokyo and Osaka and other places, uh, the technology has suggested that 45%, it has had a 45% uh, decrease in movement by Japanese, whether they're walking, driving, or on public transportation. So we're not quite yet at the point where uh, this new emergency law has has gotten the, the result that the prime minister desired. Now, there's several things here that influenced Japanese decision making. I know there was an awful lot of attention paid to the decision making on the Olympics, and some in the media have been quite critical that Abe has had thought too much about, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Olympics and not about public health. But I think that's quite unfair. Um, but there, it, it, it is true that one of the largest decisions that hung in the balance in these early months of 2020 was what was going to happen to the 2020 Olympics, which were to scheduled to be held this summer in Japan. Eventually, after tough negotiations with the IOC and with uh, other partners, they were postponed until next summer. The other thing that came into play, though, were the Japan-China economic ties and, and also its diplomacy. Pres President Xi was due to arrive in Japan in April for his first state visit. This was the product of years of very careful and difficult negotiations between the two countries. And again, Japan didn't want to tell Mr. Sh Mr. Xi he wasn't <laughs> invited anymore, and it was a Basically, the Chinese said they didn't want to insult the Japanese by saying they weren't coming. But at the end of the day, there was a discreet diplomatic statement to the fact that they have to be postponed. Um, so that's kind of the where Japan is. A little bit more on the specifics of the economic relationship between Japan and China, because it, it really does speak to um, this larger question of, of how COVID-19 is going to affect not only the Japanese economy, but, but the economic engagement between Japan and China. So 
couple of aspects where we've got some, some statistics to share. The first is that Japan and the Abe cabinet in particular has advocated strongly for tourism as a source of economic growth for Japan. And the bulk of tourists come from China and a uh, lesser extent South Korea. Um, in February, that number, the number of Chinese tourists had dropped by 58%. And in March, tourists to Japan, obviously with travel restrictions overall has dropped by 93%. So clearly a source of revenue and economic uh, uh, activity inside Japan has, has been curtailed. The, on the export side, uh, in February, we've got trade numbers with China. So imports, so exports from China, imports into Japan have dropped by 47%. Uh, the China exports from Japan to China, interestingly enough, have not been uh, uh, damaged so much, and that's largely because of Chinese demand for electronic components and other things. Um, the thing that was striking and has been written up in the media quite a bit is the Japanese businesses in China um, story. There's been informal uh, discussions and analysis done um, on, on the 2,600 Japanese companies that are in China, and about 30 or 37 to 38% of those companies asked the government for assistance in relocating out of China and back uh, to Japan or to somewhere else. So the diversification uh, in the supply chain is, is, is real. Uh, the impact and the sense of not only political risk, but economic risk in doing business in China is growing. And so that's a COVID-19 impact that's pretty important. Um, let me just finish up with some economic policy that the Japanese government has taken uh, at, right after the national emergency uh, state of national emergency was announced. Uh, the Abe cabinet passed a stimulus package. It's 108 trillion yen, which roughly translates into 1.08 trillion dollars, or about 20% of the Japanese economy. It's a massive, debt heavy. Uh, stimulus package, right? Uh, those of you who follow the Japanese economy know that Japanese debt, government debt, is uh, somewhere around two, two to two and a half percent of GDP. So Japan is already a heavily indebted country. It uses debt uh, to to manage its national economy, and this is going to exacerbate that that somewhat. Um, in terms of what the Japanese households are getting, there was a little political tussle between the conservatives and Abe's party and other political parties. <laughs> At first, Abe just wanted to give Japanese um, who had been hit, had discernible impact on their income, um, uh, a check. And now the, the opposition parties have, have uh, spoken up, everybody is getting a check. And that check was somewhere in the vicinity of $930 per person. Um, the other note, the the other noteworthy part of the stimulus, of course, speaks to this uh, this relocation of Japanese businesses in China. Since we're focused on the Japan-China relationship, about 2.5 billion dollars in assistance is going to be given to Japanese companies in China to help them relocate elsewhere. Uh, I think this is demand driven. This is not, I believe, uh, something that is a strategic decision by the Abe cabinet, but rather is responding to the survey data that was coming out of China in, in February. 2.2 billion of that uh, is dedicated to Japanese companies coming back to the Japanese market, coming back home. So the amount of assistance for companies going to a third country is, is significantly a fraction, only 10% of that. Um, the only other thing, and I'll conclude here, Jan, is um, a noteworthy and something to pay attention to is that uh, there is an antiviral drug produced by Fujifilm uh, that the Japanese government is, has encouraged. And interestingly enough, the Chinese have approved for usage inside China, one of the earliest countries to do that. Japan itself hasn't actually approved the drug, uh, but it's called Abigan, and it's an antiviral that seems to have some initial um, effectiveness in, in dealing with the symptoms, at least of COVID-19. So there is a, a pretty concerted push on trying to help on the side of how do we deal with this virus going forward from the medical side. Let me stop there for now. Thank you, Sheila, and thanks to all three of you. Um, I'd like to give you a few minutes now if any of you have something that you want to say to someone else who's spoken, something that jogged something in your thinking or something you disagree with, or up to you. Go ahead, Sheila. I just wanted to ask a question. I think one of the things for me in, in observing the Japanese COVID-19 response is um, under the, the, there was a real hesitancy and legally there still isn't the authority by the national government to 
compel citizens or to enforce behavior, right, the self-isolation. And there's been a real question in Japan of, of the authority of local and national uh, figures. And Japanese govern governors figure prominently today uh, in the public and the media, but they have no authority, to, again, to compel behavior. And they, I was wondering in the, the broader China case, and also particularly the South Korean case, how that national local authority worked its way out in terms of managing COVID-19. Sheila, you and I think alike, because oh. that was going to be the first question that I had to ask all of you. Um, and I was going to couch it in the context that, in this country at least, uh, the tension between our federal government and our states has been right up there in everyone's face. And it's, it's crossed almost every aspect of the COVID situation here, where our White House is saying one thing and the governor's Mansions are saying, well, let's hold on a second. This is what we have to think about it. And so I was going to ask all of you, how, how is that tension playing out in each of the areas that you're talking about? Even within China as well, Ilan, I'd like to know, you know, we know that there was the initial pushback or the initial cover up from Wuhan until Beijing weighed in at some point. But what about in other, either the municipalities that have provincial level uh, authority or the other provinces themselves. So uh, why don't we start with Anthony because um, Sheila mentioned you, but then I'd also like to hear from Ilana and even you Sheila as well, because you mentioned that there a new law had to be passed in order for certain things to happen. So how's it going in each of the areas you work on this tension? Um, it hasn't been quite as serious an issue as in Japan because there hasn't been a lockdown. Uh, one important thing was that uh, the epicenter of the epidemic was actually not in Seoul, which is home to 40% of the population. It was in Daegu, the fourth largest city. And so uh, they had to surge the medical system and medical supplies. Uh, so doctors and supplies all went from all over the country into Daegu, and that worked well enough uh, eventually. The other thing is that um, regional governments have had a fair amount of latitude in how they help people recover economically. So in addition to the disaster relief payments that people are getting, they may also be getting a universal income or allowance of some sort from their uh, regional government. Um, but just, just to bounce it back somewhat at, at, at Sheila, uh, I'm just curious, you know, what you what you make of the fact that, you know, yesterday, well, over in recent days, some Japanese prefectures have either uh, redeclared states of emergency in the case of Hokkaido, or uh, in the cases of places like Aichi or Kyoto, uh, declared their own preemptively without any uh, apparent legal authority or a, a green light from the central government. So, yes, I think that the thing is, you know, the Japanese constitution, of course, was, as we all know, written uh, in 1947, and it was a, an effort to democratize Japan, and it was an effort to also uh, decentralize uh, political authority, or at least representation authority. Um, but uh, Japan has a very centralized government. It, 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 the prefecture is, you know, is a French word. It looks an awful like the French system of, 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 of local autonomy. Um, all the resources are in Tokyo. Uh, income tax is gathered and redistributed by, by Tokyo to the prefectures and local governments. So there's quite a strong political push for greater local autonomy, uh, not with the COVID-19 crisis in mind, but that, that has been a backdrop of Japanese governance reform uh, conversations for a couple of decades now. So with, you know, particularly Osaka and Tokyo and other large metropolitan areas wanting more authority to, to decide to tax, to do things like that. You mentioned Hokkaido, and that was uh, interesting to watch. Governor Suzuki up there, that was the home of the cluster that I described. He didn't have the authority. He just told people to stay home. <laughs> and he told businesses to close. And again, this is Sapporo. This is the middle of ski season. Nobody was happy about it, but they did it. And, you know, it's interesting. Nobody took him to court. Nobody challenged that he had the right to do this. Um, but he was out there quite uh, early and fast to say social, you know, isolation is what we need to do. 
we need to shut it down. Uh, and he had some backup from the Ministry of Health and from medical experts as well. He didn't just go out there on his own. But it was interesting that they actually conformed, even though they were the, economic, the small businesses in particular, very disgruntled about it. Um, Koike, to, to, to contrast in Tokyo, Governor Koike has also tried to use the same kind of persuasive rhetoric. Uh, some say not very successfully, uh, but she doesn't have legal authority to enforce a stay at home order either. Um, even the prime minister can't mobilize, right? Uh, completely um, to do that, but has more under the new law, has more authority should he need to, to enforce quarantine if people were sick, for example, uh, to enforce uh, any kind of self-isolation self or the threat of some kind of punitive action if you did not self-isolate and you were suspected of being exposed or being sick. So I think it's an interesting kind of balancing act. It reflects the kind of Japanese democratic debate or debate over their democracy that's been ongoing for some time is how much authority does the state have over citizens' private behavior? And unlike the federal system, as Jan pointed out, you know, about our debate here in the United States, Prefectures have no autonomy under the law, under the Constitution, not the way our federal system is structured at all. So our, you know, we've always had that tug and pull between states' rights and federal authority. It goes all the way, you know, it goes way back, hundreds are, you know, a couple hundred years, evident in the civil rights movement and all kinds of things. And that is obviously rearing its head again for COVID-19 uh, enforcement of the stay-at-home orders. Ilana, let's turn to you. I see the situation in China as somewhat of a balancing act as well. Um, when the epidemic first broke out and the Chinese government said that it was going to cordon off the entire city of Wuhan, their five, five million people fled. Uh, and I think that they fled partially because they were afraid. Uh, people were told to quarantine and stay at home and they had the experience of SARS and so that stuck in their minds and that told them that wearing a mask was important. Wearing a mask is fairly normal in China, especially in the winter or around flu season. Um, and it told them that quarantining and staying at home was important. But at the same time, I think because of the SARS experience, they there was really a lot of mistrust of the government as well. And they really, really feared what the government was doing and whether the government was covering things up. And then as they saw sort of, you know, as they saw the, the, the situation uh, get out of control in hospitals and family members not able to get to a hospital, not able to get treatment in a hospital, um, hospitals just sort of overflowing, I think that increased their frustration, fear, and mistrust of the government. But at the same time, I think people knew what they, what they needed to do. And even in the United States, before Wuhan was, was locked down, Chinese people were wearing masks and they weren't getting together. And so when I asked Chinese friends and Chinese students what they were doing for Chinese New Year, they said to me, nothing. We're not going anywhere because we don't know who could have this virus. And we're not, Chinatowns were empty. Uh, so I think there was this combination of, yeah, we know what to do, but we're also scared and we totally mistrust our government. Um, it was interesting, Taiwan and Hong Kong, where they also had experience with SARS and knew what they had to do. Uh, you know, the, one of the things that the Taiwanese government boasts with their experience and the experience amongst their citizens is that they didn't have to tell people to not have uh, large gatherings, that the citizens themselves knew and sort of took that burden underneath themselves to stop having large gatherings. So I, I, I really do think that the experience of SARS um, is, a, is, a, is a big factor here in how Asian countries have responded to the, to the epidemic versus say how European countries and how the US is responding to the epidemic. And so I think there's, you know, there's a lot to learn from Asian countries, but it's especially because of our federalist system and because there's, there's you know, we, we really can't have a coordinated response in the US and we can't tell people to quarantine. Um, and especially we, 
one, one of the things that I think is frustrating for people who have watched the response in a place like China uh, versus the response in, in the US is that people with mildly ill cases in China and other parts of Asia are sent to a central quarantine facility. Uh, people with mildly ill cases in the US are sent home where they can infect the rest of their families. And if, if there is a, a facility and now more and more sort of um, hotels and universities are opening up their, their empty rooms uh, to, you know, to people who are, who are in need, first responders who don't want to go home, healthcare workers who don't want to go home, and people who have been hospitalized but no longer need to be hospitalized. But we're still sending people with mildly ill cases home um, because it would be difficult to send them to a centralized quarantine unit. Uh, so there's, there's, there is a lot to learn, uh, that, and I think it's been hard for us to learn it on this first pass. What I'm hoping is that if and when, and that probably will happen, we have a second wave in the United States, that we'll actually look back to the experiences that we've had and that we'll, we'll be learning from our own experiences. Thank you all. I wanted to spend a little more time and gave you the latitude to, to talk more about this, especially the tension between the federal and the local governments, because I think that's something that's of great interest to our audience, given that almost 99% of them are people who represent state offices that deal with China or deal with East Asia. We talked about Several of you talked about the economic issues and um, what we were really, what we were hoping to get at because it's, it's on everybody's mind here in the United States is when can we open up again? When can, we re, when can we be resilient? What is our plan? Who's going to lead the way? And uh, I saw a recent McKenzie report noted that in even before COVID, uh, but in an increasingly volatile world, that it's been the dynamism and the speed and the agility of Asian companies that have contributed to the region's macroeconomic stability. Um, and while I suppose I shouldn't be, I was surprised to learn that there's 43% of the world's largest companies by revenues have their headquarters in Asia. Now I know, Sheila, that some of the Japanese companies are going back home to Japan, but that's still Asia. So my question to the three of you actually is, um, how would you assess the viability of these kinds of companies throughout Asia, but particularly in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, China itself? Um, how do you assess their viability in terms of, are they going to come out of COVID as the leaders they were before this? And will they be leaders not just for their own countries or regions, but for the world? I, I will I will jump in. I, I fear jumping in. But I will try to jump in uh, just with the Japanese example. I think um, my sense is you've got you've got multinationals in Japan. You've had multinationals in Japan now for decades and decades, and they have um, diversified their their manufacturing locales based on several factors. It depends on the sector we're talking about, right? So, um, Japanese automakers, of course, have been invested in China. They've been invested in Mexico. They've been invested in Southeast Asia. They've been invested here in North America. And now with the new trade agreement, we'll be able to expand into Europe. But there's a lot of other sectors of, of, of multinationals, financial services, right? The new internet-based uh, economy. Um, these are all going to be affected, I think, in different ways. The, those that need and require uh, the global supply chain. Uh, I can hazard a guess. I don't have any factual information to give you, but are deeply worried, I'm sure, about how that supply chain will get reorganized in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, without a doubt, that supply chain is going to be reorganized, at least temporarily. Um, and I think that's part of the indication you see in that $2.2 billion uh, part of the Japanese stimulus. Um, that's not driven by politics, that's driven by economic risk or the sense, sense of economic risk that the COVID-19 has, has laid bare. But what it feeds into, of course, right, the economic behavior also now feeds into this broader questioning globally in Japan as well, uh, but not with as, as much strength, I suspect, as here in the United States. But 
about what whether whether uh, consolidating uh, manufacturing in a national economy is a better strategy than relying on an integrated and mutually economically interdependent global economy. And I think the the political tide, economic rationale aside, aside the political tide is shifting. I don't see that yet shift that shift yet in Japan all by itself. But COVID-19 could raise some, some significant questions, especially about Japan's economic interdependence with China. Um, so I, I think you're going to see the debate emerge. You're seeing some practical out, you know, implications already, but I think you're going to have more of that political debate once we get on the other side of the COVID-19 hump. 